real a real kick in the rear end, or as I say on this explicit podcast, it really should be a kick in the ass to all of you blind people listening all over the world to, to get up and start being productive and start living the life you want and start getting an education and just going about your business. Because the fact that there's a drop, as you, as you, as you noted in your data, that there was a drop of blind people participating at the political level in the 1950s. Well, as a matter of fact, in the 1950s, that's when blind people started to be able to get some certain jobs that blind people do not do anymore, such as piano tuning and things like that. And now, of course, there's going to be a comment in the audience. Well, I'm a piano tuner. Well, great. Cool. But, you know, nowadays, piano tuning, um, there were several other trades um, that blind people did in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s that are just not, just not practiced anymore. And I think what happened was, as the country, you know, started to modernize, you know, after we went through the world wars, you know, conflict in Korea, all of that, I think that technology in our country advanced to a point even back then where blind people felt that they needed that they did not need to try as hard as they might have had in the early 20th century and i don't know that's just my interpretation of that i also think that it's important to only set realistic goals i'm not saying that we shouldn't reach for the stars you're absolutely right um uh, absolutely right peggy we should but it's equally important to only invest time, and this is my opinion, it's only important to invest time in things that are realistic and are truly going to be the most productive and most effective goals for us to follow. So there is a difference between kind of floundering when you reach for the stars and realistically reaching for the stars. And I, I'm absolutely fascinated by your research. Um, and you have a magnificent speaking voice for podcasting. How many other podcasters have you have reached out to you for your historical knowledge? That's what I want Not to know. Not near enough. I need to, I need to reach out to many, many more and get on uh, more programs to talk about this. Um, you know, one of the things that, that you mentioned about being realistic about reaching out indeed and that you know when you're talking about the people from like 1880 1900 even through the 1920s they when they hit the the lowest level in their life there was no welfare system that that would be a, a safety net there was no rehabilitation program, especially if you went blind after the age of, say, 18, 21 or whatever. Uh, if you did get any kind of county or city assistance, your name was put in the paper and it shamed your family and that you many times had to make a choice. Do I try and live on my own and get a little bit of support from the community or do I stay at home and not alienate my family? But these people also faced the, the reality that they would have to go to the poorhouse or an asylum. And I'm not talking an asylum for the blind, because especially by the 1880s, if they had asylum attached to it, they were probably a school for the blind. Now, there were I, homes for elderly blind people, but not mo much for women. Women ended up going into asylums for the mentally ill. Um, and, which the that's, life and that's a whole, that's a whole other episode about that mess. Oh but. my gosh. And if you went into a poor farm, um, I studied a few of the poor farms where the police kind of just locked you in at night and honey, you're on your own. And if you did not have somebody to watch your back, you didn't get any sleep. You didn't come out with your shoes the next day. If you were a woman, um, you may not come out alive the next day. Uh, so I so think, going I to the poor farm of, was desperation. Indeed. indeed. I, I, so I think, I think some of our younger, well, by the way, this is only for adults, but I mean, some of the people my age who maybe you're not so familiar with poor farm and 
can, can you maybe define some of these terms you're using? Because a lot of younger people are not remotely as connected with history as I am, so they wouldn't really know about this. Can you give a brief history lesson on what you mean by all those terms you just used, please? Okay. Yeah, you know, that's a very good point. Um, and I sometimes forget that. The poor farms ranged from a walled off section of land, you might say, um, fenced in, what have you, where the people who were indigent um, were just put there by the city and, you know, stay off our streets. We don't want you begging. You can't beg here. You, if, if you don't have a place to stay, go stay over there and stay out of our way. Uh, or the poor farm was literally a farm that you might be sent to sometimes by the courts, sometimes by the welfare system or social work system or whatever there was, uh, where you would go and work off whatever your debt was to the community until that debt was paid or until you could find a job to get off of the poor farm. So you would be doing farm chores, farm labor. Um, it could vary from anything um, like that. There was a place in Delaware that was a house that took in uh, uh, people who had no place else to go. And it was probably a very small, what we would consider today a small house. It was a three bedroom home in 1900. And you know, back then bedrooms were about eight by 10 in many of the houses the, yeah the, the, be but a I mean, master a three, that would be bigger and, a, and i mean a three a three bedroom in 1900 that would be from the perspective of a blind person of that era that that would be a mansion that would be a big scary mansion right and from, they from would that put perspective and right. in delaware there was over 60 people in one of those homes so imagine having a home Ooh, that's la. about maybe 1200 feet Ooh, la, la. Be pushing in my in my second language of french we say Ooh, la, la, to that and that says this is now I'm I I mean you're a hundred percent correct. How did you how did you come to gain these figures? I think that's important. Um, like I said, I have um, learned a lot about researching as a genealogist, and have put that skill into my research. I have found newspaper articles. I have found um, letters. Um, let's just take Delaware and the house that we're talking about, where there were sixty people in this three bedroom house. The Agency for the Blind had just been developed by a blind person, and basically it was a workshop that could house up to 12 people who could live there and then work in this workshop making brooms or mops. They had a couple of people. Uh, one they hired, one was probably unpaid for the first couple of years, that went around to every community looking for blind people to come to this workshop and make brooms. And that's where they found this guy who was about 30 years old and he was sitting in a chair and he didn't talk to people. Uh, he just sort of sat there. Now he had a very traumatic childhood as well. Uh, he went blind in his oh, early 20s but he had been orphaned somehow. Uh, we don't really know how he had been orphaned, but the county placed him at a farm to uh, basically a, an adoption, if you will. They were his custodial guardians, but he had to work. He didn't go to school. He had to work the farm, um, and he had a farming accident uh, in his 20s, and he was just left on his own. So the uh, worker from the Commission for the Blind, it was called that in Delaware at the time, found him, brought him to the broom shop. They really weren't sure because he wasn't, he had no spirit. He wasn't communicative. They just didn't know if he was going to work out. He blossomed at the broom shop. He, he finally found out he could do something. He, he, they talk about him in the annual report. They talk about him in some of the letters about how he didn't realize he could use his hands, how he could use the skills that he had 
on the farm, use them as a blind person. Then he made the newspapers again about a year before he died. He only lived to about 34, 35 years old. Um, he was in the workshop and they uh, sent him down to the basement to get more broom corn. Broom corn is the straw that you use to make the to make the bottom part of the broom. And he went down the, the stairs. Do you mean the do you mean the 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 the, br the brush part? You mean the brush part? The, okay, the, the bristles, bristles on the, the broom. Bristles, indeed, the bristles indeed. on the broom. Got it you, was got made you. of broom corn, which is a a plant kind of like kind of like hay, sort of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he went down and he smelled something. Mm -hmm. And he thought, oh my gosh, the broom corn's on fire. Now, uh, broom corn is like hay. Like I said, it goes up awful fast. So he runs back up the stairs, sounds the alarm, gets some water, screams for blankets, brings, and he and a couple of other blind guys put out the fire in the basement wow. and became heroes because That's this cool. was a wooden structure, you know? I mean, <laughs> it wasn't going to take long and they were all going to be toast. Uh, so those are how I find out about him. I find out about him through letters. I utterly, find out about him through the Utterly annual fascinating, report. utterly fascinating, yeah. Re loving this stuff. Uh, it's horrible. That's a horrible story, but it's incredibly interesting to me. But he yeah. died feeling complete. You know, I think that's the neat part about that story is he went to a broom shop where he earned his keep. He had money to spend, to buy new clothes. Because uh, if you didn't have money to buy new clothes, let's take the the industrial home for the blind in Iowa. Iowa was a progressive state for the education of blind people. Had the School for the Blind was started by Samuel Bacon, who was a blind guy from the Ohio School for the Blind, who started several schools for the blind. Uh, he's somebody that um, there's a lot out there about Samuel Bacon. I would encourage you to, to read about him. Uh, he started the Iowa School for the Blind. It became the Iowa College for the Blind. The alumni from that group were chiropractors, teachers, public school teachers, even in the 1880s and 90s. Um, they were the piano tuners. They were the businessmen. They owned their own stores, uh, music teachers. They started an alumni association, and one of the goals was to build a home for blind people who weren't quite as fortunate, where they could make brooms or uh, mops or what have you, and they would be able to um, fend for themselves. So they built the uh, industrial home for the blind. And it became, it was researched very well. There were some sex, successful industrial homes for the blind on the East Coast, and they used them as examples. But once it got built, the parties changed when the governor was um, elected a different party. Uh, the director of the home for the blind was given to a political pal of the new governor. And who knew nothing about blindness? The people who went to this home for the blind, it was only open for about 10 years, found themselves in worse shape than when they went in to the point where the newspaper articles would plead for clothing so that so-and-so could go back home on the train. Uh, they didn't have shoes. Their clothes were worn out. <clears throat> the staff at the at the industrial home for the blind the director was paid fifty dollars a month room and board and that meant room and board for his family he had uh, two daughters his wife was uh, paid twenty five dollars a month and her room and board where the blind people had to pay for their room and board out of what they <laughs> earned at the home, but they didn't always have stock for oh, the huh. farm funny, or the funny broom. how funny how that seems really on it that seems kind of unethical i don't know even from my perspective that's well that's not, partly why it was closed down yeah, because yeah, there were I, blind, I, was being, I was being sarcastic that's that's ridiculous there were literally and, blind people that owed the state money 
when they left the home for the blind um, okay, well, to then go I mean, back to their community. Well, okay, well, so the, in that and in, in that case study that shows them that that home failed. If yes. you go, 